Good afternoon and welcome to Phillips Mill Art Talk. I'm Laura Womack. With me is executive producer, Jen McHugh. Hi all. Many of us struggle with inspiration. Some of us struggle with managing and organizing projects. Our maker today seems to have none of those issues. Sue Ann Rainey is a photographer, painter, cookbook author, and she prints baby onesies. Sue Ann has been an artist all of her life. She studied graphic design and photography at Temple's Tyler School of Art. She's a member of the Phillips Mill Photo Committee and her work has been exhibited at the mill many times. She's been in the Ellerslie show in Trenton and many, many other shows. And we've asked her here to join us today to talk about her process and um, how she's able to be so prolific in so many different media. Sue Ann Rainey, welcome to our talk. Hi, thank you for having me. And welcome also to our audience. Thanks for being here with us on this lovely Sunday afternoon. We'd love to have you join in the conversation and we'll take your questions as we go along. Please put them in the Q&A where we can find them easily. And uh, Jen will be posting relevant information in the chat. So Sue Ann, let's jump right in with your work. Uh, I'd like people to get an idea of your range and um, you know the just how how productive you are. So um, today we happily have lots of things to look at. Lots. I kept sending more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go with Kaleidoscope of Mythical Places. And this is a series, Sue Ann. Tell us about the series first before we talk about this picture. Okay, this started out during COVID. I realized that I really wasn't supposed to be going anywhere and doing things, but I had to create. So I drive around in my car with my iPhone and take photos. And then I found this um, program called Layout. It's an app. And then I would play with the photos on the app, on my phone, and be able to come up with totally new images like this one. This was from the flood. On um, the day after Christmas, there was a big river flood. And this was, um, I went down to a bunch of different bridges and this was the Frenchtown bridge that I got a shot of. And this, it had it's a nice a very, sky. sorry. Yeah, this one had a nice sky and a nice angle on the bridge and I was able to, to play with this. So this one has eight images, um, what you right. do. Help. With you can Help flip us that. find those, yeah, Sue yeah, Ann, because yeah. whenever I look at it, I think of it as four, but I know I'm wrong on that. Yeah, yeah just the one, like the top quarter is one image, which is where the, the bridge goes up and stops. That's one image. And then I flopped it, to, you know, so then there were two of them next to each other. And then I copied that again and, and pasted that again on the other side. So there's so four the images across the top. Four images across the top. So then the I peak of that bridge, it's not a peaked bridge, it's a, right. but the peak is from the, the app. Right. Well, that's just from a piece of the, the bridge. Right. The bridge was going up. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I like it. And then um, Crazy Water. It, was, it had all these really cool patterns in the water. It looked more like a tapestry. I had some green grass and there was some sticks and it was just really interesting water. So I just called that the Crazy Water. Okay, great. All right. And um, next up, Jen, is Big Sky. And oh, this is, uh, this is a yeah. newer one. We went to Wyoming for vacation. And every day we woke up and we saw this huge, um, the Bighorn Mountains behind us, behind our, our cabin we were staying in. And the sky was just amazing every day. So I took lots of pictures. And this one ended up to be a good one because it had tons of sky the strip of Bighorn Mountains, and then lots of green, green trees. So this is just four images, mirrored and flopped. It looks to me like um, sort of a surreal Versailles or something like that. Right, and it gets like a tapestry look in the middle, I, I find, and people seem to see faces a lot. I, I started out posting these on Instagram and people would start saying, oh, I see this face, I see an animal face or a fox face. And, so it was fun to post them on Instagram and get a reaction from people because it was during COVID when I wasn't seeing people and I like to get feedback on my art. So this was a nice way to do that. Right. I think um, 
uh, art was uh, sort of a, a bit of a savior, a therapy for a lot of us during the COVID shutdown. Um, okay, next up, Jen, is Green Bridge. Uh, this was the bridge I was going over to my daughter's house in Milford. So this was the Milford Bridge and it had wonderful light on it. There were shadows and bright light and shadows everywhere. So I, I, I stopped in the middle of the bridge, shot the picture and it was during COVID. So there was hardly any traffic. And then I played with the picture later on. I just love how it's like a weaving, uh, you know, the, the metals weaving into each other. Right. It definitely has that structure. It also makes me think, uh, originally I was going to say, it makes me think of like uh, acrylic paintings from, um, I don't know, late 20th century, but now I'm looking at it and it reminds me of a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright window. Yeah. Right. With a lot of triangles. Right. Yeah. So what is appealing to you, Sue Ann, about uh, working with this app and making these kaleidoscopes? Um, I guess just because it's a whole different thing. It's not like just the Milford Bridge anymore. It's an actual pattern. It's a weaving. It's light and dark. And um, sometimes I turn them you know, 90 degrees and, and they're totally different if you look at them that way. It's just a whole new, new image right. for me. To, and it's something more fun that I was doing on my phone just to pass the time during COVID. Right. It was a long time, but I think artists really thrive on having that time to do things. I had no other um, obstructions and things I had to go to, you know, I had lots of time to create. So it was actually- And do you find, because you're so, I, I'm just fascinated, Sue Ann, with how productive you are and the many different areas that you work in. Do you find yourself stuck for ideas ever? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, I have downtime where I just sort of, um, I'll, I'll mat some things and go through some old things and look at them just to assess what I've done because I'll do pile up paintings during the month and I just take some downtime and I go through them and I toss a couple or I turn them over and I paint on the backs of the paint because I, I try to use the paper up if it's a painting that I don't like I'll turn it over and use the back just to be more productive and I definitely need downtime where I can focus on things that I've been working on. So you, that's interesting. So you use the time when you're not inspired to, with a new idea to uh, get sort of that workman, workman's, you know, tasks done. That's a great way. Does it help you then come up with ideas? Because I think the creative brain a lot of times is working in the background when we're doing one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's working on new ideas. Does that work for you? Um, yeah, I try to just um, look at the things. I'll be matting things and getting them ready for the next time I have a show eventually. Um, and yeah, then if I, I come up with something, I write it down in a notebook. Uh, I keep notebooks where I, I write things down for, for when I do have some time to focus on something new. But it is a good time to take a break and assess what you've done to see where you're going, if you're going in the right direction, or if you wanna try a different direction. Is that a very conscious process for you to think about, you know, I don't, I wonder how many artists do that where they look back over their work and say, am I going in the right direction? I don't know, maybe they do. And that's, that is, um, that makes a lot of sense. But do yeah, you I think you need to, to see where you're gonna go next, you know, what the next yeah. step is. All right. Okay, Jim, what's up next? I think we have a couple more in the Kaleidoscope series. Oh, this, uh, yeah. this was coming out of the Michener Art Museum. And I always love those doors, the old jailhouse doors. And it, it looks out on Mercer Museum. So, I, I just find it fascinating how these pictures of scenes that are really very familiar to us, uh, when you use this, um, what's it called? Layout app? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it be, makes it something in totally different because here, I, I don't know, maybe it's just my brain, but it looks, it has the colors of Renaissance paintings. It almost looks like some of those um, paintings that they did on, on uh, wood panels. Uh, I don't know. Do you, is that just me, Sue Ann? <laughs> oh, 
Probably not. I'm sure other people see other things in them. I just like how it changes. I could change these bricks to make, make it look like they were like a curved, you know, a curved right. hill because of the way they connected. Right. Yeah. Okay. We've got one more step up book spines. Okay. Okay. This I took. Um, took the photo a while ago before they sold. This was the bookstore in Frenchtown and it was sold and totally re, redone and these steps are now gone. So I was so happy that I had a picture of them. They're book spines from the last owner of the bookstore and right. they're now brick steps. So I'm just happy that I had them and I was able to play with them. And I made some cards with them and sent cards out to people. So they they were, I pumped yeah. up the color and you know, played with the, uh, sharpened them up. They made them a lot brighter than they really were. They were pretty faded out. Do you do a lot in Photoshop, Sue Ann? This is just all on my phone, on this app, on the app. And yeah. are you, what kind of, what kind of camera are you using? Are you using your phone or are you using- Yeah, uh, my, this is my iPhone. I think it's a six, yeah. Your iPhone six, uh -huh. I love that. Do you ever take out like a big digital SLR or? Yeah, I have my camera that I take with me, but this is just more fun stuff that I can do while I'm driving around or if I'm sitting at home and I have some free time, I'll just open my phone up and find some images to play with. Okay, I'm gonna have to check I out get that. I kind of burn out sitting in front of the computer all the time. Right. So it's a nice break to just look at my phone instead. Right. Okay, and now we have uh, moving into a new series called Disappearing Structures. And this is very classical photography, it seems to me. Yes, I was taking pictures. I noticed in Doylestown and around the area, they started um, buying up lots and demolishing old buildings that had been there for, from when I was a kid. So I realized that I really needed to start documenting them be before they all disappeared. So this was one that was there for a long time. I watched it sort of fall into, you know, disrepair and it was empty for years. So I, I stopped a couple of times and took pictures. This one was in the winter, so there was snow. So it looked a lot more desolate than normal. But a few months later, it was demolished. And then there were huge piles of dirt there. It's gonna be a super Wawa. But I'm just glad that I, I have the documentation of this old historic building. And I had a big exhibit of this and uh, I was in the upstairs gallery in Peddler's Village and it was um, my turn to do a, a solo exhibit. So I did an exhibit of all these disappearing structures and it was in the newspaper and these people that used to live here, Ben's, I guess it was Ben's daughter contacted me. She was so interested. She saw this photo in the paper and she was so interested. So she told me the whole story that her father had grown up there this was his auto body shop and the house next to it, which I have a picture of, was where they lived. And it was so interesting that this really connected with her and she was happy that I documented it. So that was, that was a plus. I thought that was interesting. I don't know if she ever came into the exhibit. I told her about it. But. And I think we have um, a Ben's auto body too. Is that right, Jen? Yep. There's an angle. Yeah, the angle. Perspective on that. And here you're seeing some very classical, uh, uh, I'm losing my words today, very classical sure composition with, yeah. yes, with the lines coming in. Yeah. With the lines going down as the building went away. Yeah. Right, exactly. I just loved how it was just so barren and it used to be this busy auto body place back in like the 60s, I would guess, 60s and 70s. So when did this building come down? Um, a few years ago. I went to the gym right across from this for years and all of a sudden one day they were like driving around with the bulldozer right. <laughs> taking it down. Okay Jim what is our uh our next one in the disappearing structures series? Entangled. Oh this is the house this was the house that this woman said her husband had lived in so he had grown up there and they had just let all the trees grow and all the vines were like all over. It was so interesting that you wouldn't even notice it. I think if you were driving by, this is right on Main Street in Doylestown, um, South Main Street, past Cross Keys, as you're going down by all the car dealerships. This was right across from the, uh, the Mercedes-Benz dealership. And I think a lot of people probably didn't even notice there was a house there. 
I did not. I drive back there all the time. Right. This one has such great texture. Oh, cool. Yes. I played, played with the texture and I had a friend of mine print it for me and he was really able to bring up a lot more texture. And he printed it on a really nice um, Hahnemann printmaking type paper. So it was nice. All of those details make such a difference, don't they? Yes, the printing and the kind of paper it's on, like looking at it on the screen, you, you can't tell that it's full of detail and all these ivies, it's just amazing. So Sue Ann, we were talking about your uh, artwork and you told me that you had an old Instamatic 110 when you were a kid, which yes. uh, boy, I'd forgotten all about that camera and yeah, that just that brought nice. memories back. Did that influence you? This was one where you mail, you had to mail off the- uh, Right. Yeah. That was my first camera, 110 Instamatic, a little skinny thing. And it had a little cartridge that came out and you mailed it in the envelope. And since the way it was so magical, you'd get it back. And I'd have like, I think it was a 12, I think 12 exposure, maybe I'd get 12 pictures back. And maybe it, had a, it had a mechanical uh, slide button, I think, to <laughs> take the shutter button to take the <laughs> picture. So having a camera that early, because you studied photography in college, having a camera as a young person obviously had to influence you to go into photography. Did you stick with it through that whole time? Yeah, yeah, I got to use, my dad had a Kodak, a, like it was all manual Kodak that he let me use that he had used when he was in the Navy. I had a nice leather case. I had to, you know, put the Tri-X film in the back and, and that was fun. And then I learned how to um, learn how to develop the film and do printing in high school. There was this one other guy, R Richard and I, who were interested in the darkroom. So we taught each other. We got, I can think we got books out and figured out we had the teacher order us the chemicals and we figured out how to do the film and print the print the prints it was fun. Then in college, I actually learned the, you know, the better way to do it. And, but we just sort of taught each other, made it work because we were interested. So I think your father sounds like he must have been or must be a very interesting person who had a lot of influence on you. You told me that he has he had no electrical tools. Everything were the old mechanical hand tools. Right. You know, like an old drill and you know, like a hand saw. So whenever I would want to do something, I would have to use all these manual tools down on his workbench. I think later on he bought a table saw, but early on, yeah, he just had the, all the manual stuff. I guess so that's was that a, Sorry. Was that uh, sort of, a, you know, was that a principle with him or just what he had and why get new when you've got something already? What was Probably his what, what he had? And it wasn't his main thing. It was just something that he would have these things. Maybe they were left over from his father. I'm not sure. He somehow had all these old tools and I thought they were great. So I learned how to use all manual tools. It great. must have given you um, a great sense of empowerment to be able to do things with your hands that uh, I, I'm, I suspect, Sue Ann, that this must be an influence in uh, why you're able to do so many different things because you weren't intimidated uh, because you had this, you know, really hands-on childhood. Right, yeah, I would help him do things. And I would just go down to the basement and play with things and figure out how to make something. I'd come up with something, look what I made. <laughs> so what kinds of things were you making? Just little things out of wood. I don't know, I made like a little game with them um, where I drilled a bunch of holes and put um, golf tees. My dad was a big golfer. He had all these golf tees. It was one of these triangular games where I drilled holes and put golf tees in and you have one hole to begin with. And then you jump the, right. the pegs and you're supposed to end up with one tee at the end. So I made one of those. I've seen that game. I'm impressed yeah. that you made your own. How old were you, Sue Ann? Maybe like 14. Impressive. With all and the hand drill, little hand drill. Yeah. You hand drilled all those golf tees. Little holes. Little golf holes. Little golf holes. Tees. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And when you, <laughs> I think you said you even use these skills, hand, these hands-on skills in your math classes, which I think is <laughs> fascinating. Oh, yes. I made an abacus out of um, uh, wires, um, hangers that I bent into an arch, three hangers. And then I, we had all these um, acorns in our yard. So I, I collected all the acorn caps and I drilled through them all so that I could thread them onto the, the wire so that they would be my abacus. So I had three of them, you had nine each, you know, so as you got up to nine and you flip the next one over. 
And that was my abacus. And then I had the main board that I drilled the six holes in to put the hangers into. It was just something that I was, it was fun that I could make that myself with all the tools of the basement. So now I'm assuming that the assignment for your math class was not to make an abacus. I don't know what it was, but that was what my assignment was for myself, I guess. And I'm also going to assume that you got an A on that one, Sue Ann. I don't remember. <laughs> I think I saved it for a while. I thought it was so cool. Did you, do you remember how the teacher reacted to that? No, I don't. I just remember that I, lo I loved making it. It was the making <laughs> process. It was more fun than showing the teacher, I think. And the, the reaction wasn't what was important to you. It was the making. Right, yeah. And do you think that's still the case for you, Sue Ann, that it's the making rather, yeah. Exactly, like I make on this one, I made the frame um, out of uh, old barn, barn wood. My husband and I helped, he helps me uh, plane the wood down and we put grooves in the back. And like people say, oh, they get these photographs and they have somebody print it and frame it and mat it for them. I'm like, oh, that's no fun. <laughs> I like to print it and I like to cut the mat. I like to make the frame. I go out to the glass place and I buy the piece of glass. It's the whole process. I enjoy it. The whole, so when it's done, I've made the whole thing. Yeah. That's just something that I enjoy doing. It makes me happy to make the whole piece. It gives you satisfaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So is it, do you think it's that satisfaction of having it done it yourself or the creative drive? What is it that, that uh, keeps you moving forward on all these different projects? I think all of that, just the creative ideas and that I'm able to carry them out. And you know, I'll ask my husband to help me do a lot of the things, but he helps me out and we figure it out. And yeah, it's just, it's very fulfilling. Is he creative? No, but he's very, um, he's engineering. So he knows how to make things. He has all these wood tools from his father that he got when his father moved. All right, very good. Do you've got one of those old hand planers? No, he has all electric stuff. All electric stuff. So what do you saw? think? It's nice. It's way quicker. I can do it myself. <laughs> a top saw, a table saw, a planer, an electric planer. It's nice. Very good. I have a, a frame maker, like a joiner frame maker wow. that I put the pieces together and push the angle pieces in for the corners. Nice. So the whole frame in my basement. All right, very good. I, I actually do okay. have some hand planers and they're kind of fun, but I never know when to stop. So it ends up, I'm not good at it clearly. Yeah. Uh, so Jen, I think next up we've got Par Pipersville Barn Garage. Yes, here we go. Oh, this is from the disappearing structures. This barn is still there, but um, a building group bought it. So I was figuring they were gonna knock it down soon, but it's been there the whole 12 years I've lived here. So um, and it's a really cool, it's a several barns with the garages in between that connect them all. And it's just, it looks so interesting in the winter. It totally changes it. It makes it into this really graphic, rustic, piece because it hasn't been painted in so long and it's just very that's a great description of it Sue Ann is graphic and rustic I like how much white there is in this image and again you've got really nice composition lines coming in from the sides yes uh, almost a sort of a horizontal perspective yeah I like all the lines the horizontal lines and the vertical lines and then the angle of it and this, again, a friend of mine, Peter, did the printing for me. So he was able to really get the texture. He printed on, on a nice Hanamule paper. So it's a nice, like, soft, cottony paper. So do you do any of your own printing now of photographs? Or it sounds like you work with your friend. Um, he does my final stuff. I print. I can only print um, eight and a half by 11s on my printer now. I, I just bought a, a, a proof printer that I can do in my office. Because I found I wasn't using it enough, and then the inks were drying up, and the inks are what cost you all the money. If you don't use it enough, then it gets all dirty, and you have to keep cleaning it. So I just I proof them at my place, and then I send the files to Peter, and he, he I, I'll go and sit with them to, you know, decide what kind of paper we're going to use. Or right, he does a great job. And so now I'm a, I'm going to venture a guess that with your um, disappearing structure series, you're using a digital SLR or a big yes. camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use a Nikon. Okay. You're getting a lot of refinement on that. 
Okay, we're gonna switch. I think that's all for the photography that we have, Jen. I think we're gonna move now into the watercolors. We actually have some so one local more. barns. There are some oh, yeah. whole barn series. Uh, right, yeah. Okay, great. So if you wanna look at those real quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to cap. I'm trying to capture a lot of barns and mills in the area because they're slowly falling apart too. Right. This so is this a lovely is Stover Myers mill. This is right down the road from me, and this one has some tarps over some of these roofs. So they really haven't had time to fix the roofs. So I'm hoping that they don't all disappear. But the stone mill will be there forever. But some of these wooden buildings. Um, and yeah, the wooden buildings. I think they have a lot of character to them and they did they're not as storied as the barns or the stone buildings in bucks county but these little um you know outbuildings are uh i find them fascinating I, maybe yeah. it's sort of the miniature aspect of that or something but i'm glad that you're capturing that that most people would take the picture from the stone house perspective well and then right. they have it the but i liked all the add-ons they had yeah like they had this lumber area where you would stack the lumber and then they had a shed and then another shed and another shed so and they're really telling a story right okay jim what's next stover where is stover myers mill while she's stover myers mill it's on dark holler road in uh between tinicum and i guess by tinicum township it crosses um the tohican creek okay it goes right by that and powers it and then this is goes, tinicum yeah barn. This is the Tinicum barn. I drive by this a lot. This is right on River Road in Tinicum. They have the arts festival here every year. And people have weddings in the barn. They were before COVID. Um, it's a big, beautiful, big barn. It and is. It's beautiful property and it's well, look how nicely taken care it is. Yeah. So do you think it's disappearing? This one's not disappearing. No, no. People use it for weddings and we, and the, uh, actually the Tinicum Civic Association probably have that name wrong, something like that. They help keep it up by having the Tinicum Arts Festival. And right. they have, you know, some of that money goes back into this barn. So it actually stays there. So that's nice. But I love how all the trees are around it. And in the fog, I love how the trees, you know, come and go in your view. With the, with the and this so one that you're fog. framing the barn with, with this nice arch over the, the cupola. Right. Over. It's like yeah. arching over the, the barn, right. sort of holding it there in between the trees. I had a friend who used to live near here, and he was interested in some photographs. So I took a whole bunch of the barn, and he selected, I think he selected two, of, two or three of them. So I think this one, and he selected one that was black and white in the fog, and then he selected a fall one. All right. I, I What's next, Jen? I think it might be one of my favorites. Oh, this one, yeah. This is lovely, yeah. This is on Torrey Road in Tinica, on the way to um, High Rock State Park, Ralph Stover State Park. And this was, um, I just love driving around after it snows because everything is so different. Like when it's green all around it, you don't quite see this barn as much. But in the winter with the snow, it was just fabulous. It just popped. Uh, I pop the color a lot more with um in Photoshop, but I just loved how it it was just so so beautiful popping out of all the the gray and white and the stone uh wall on the front really captured my eye. Nice uh, part as the base for the photograph to have a solid stone wall. Nice. Let's see um crazy train. Oh. <laughs> I, say, uh, I find this an interesting one, Sue Ann, because uh, I, it's almost an abstract. And um, with all of those different colors, and in a way, it reminds me of your Kaleidoscope series. Oh, but, right. That's true. Yeah, because the image itself is almost doing, creating some of those lines that you get in your kaleidoscope. Right, the receding. I seem to like receding lines. Right. Yeah. This is a popular um, train for photographers. All the photographers in the area know this train. It's in Lambertville, back by where the boat launches, where the Swan Creek rowers go from. 
So um, a lot of my friends have photographed here. It's just beautiful. I went in the winter so, um, so I could get more light to come in through the windows. And I just love how every time you go, it's totally repainted inside. <laughs> People just have fun painting. Very good. Um, Jen, I think we've got a question coming up. Yeah, sorry, I've not been checking on those. Well, Jim said he's been to that crazy train and he said it is a crazy train. <laughs> <laughs> so aptly named. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a question from Dennis. He asked Sue Ann, um, do you remember the first piece of art you sold? And if so, what was it and what medium? It was a photograph. I think I was might have still been in high school. I I uh, stopped by the there was a place called Accents and Images in Peddler's Village, where he had different kinds of art. And I went in and talked to the guy one day, and I told him, "Hey, I do photography. Would you be interested in seeing it?" I think I, think I was 18, 18 or nineteen. He's like, "Sure, bring some stuff in. We can hang some stuff up." I'm like, "Really? Like I didn't even have money for framing or anything." So I bought these little cheap plastic frames and. I took a bunch of things in, hung them up. And I think a month or two later, he's like, hey, I sold one of your photographs. I'm like, oh, excellent. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it that somebody would buy a photograph from an 18-year-old kid. Yeah. <laughs> Did that sort of get you addicted, Sue Ann? That sort of yeah. keeps you going. Yeah. I'm like, oh, so more than just I like this stuff. You know, you start to realize that other people are interested in artwork, which is great. And do you still get that thrill when you sell something? Yeah, I love to see when where it goes to, like I'll, I'll contact the people. I send out thank you notes if I don't see them, if it's at a gallery or something. I try to always get the people's name and address so I can send them a thank you note. And, you know, just find out what they did with it or where they're hanging it. It's nice to have it connect to someone that wants it in their house. Actually, I had a, a, a solo show in Doylestown, must have been uh, at least 15 years ago. And this is where I had a lot of barns and mills. And this one couple came. It was at the Medical Healing Art Center in Doylestown. This one couple came and they bought six, six photographs. And they wanted them all framed similarly. So I had to take some of them down and put the same color frames on them. And then when they came back to pick those up, they bought another one. So that, that was really exciting. That was the first show I've ever had where somebody bought you know seven, seven of my photographs. And, they were going to put them all over their like living room and their dining room. It was really fun. So that was, that was a good thing. I mean, that keeps you going because then you're like, oh, yes, this is, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Right. All right. Let's take a look at your watercolors. I think it'll be, it's interesting to see your watercolors because uh, after looking at your photographs, because you have a consistent interest in architecture, Sue Ann. Yes, I love <laughs> buildings and receding lines. You'll see the windows are receding. Yeah, I just love corners of buildings and, um, and trees. I like trees too. So yeah, this was back in the, um, the pork yard alley. I was back up against the wall of a building to, to get the view of the boathouse. I'm sure many people know where the boathouse is, but if you don't, it's back pork yard alley, um, Hamilton's Grill. My back was up against Hamilton's grill room. And this is looking at, so this was fun. This was during COVID, was it? It was during COVID. So there was hardly anybody back there. But then this couple, couple came back and there was one food delivery that the truck parked in my way for a while. But otherwise I pretty much had the alley to myself. Right. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. What, what's up next? Here we go, Sheard's uh, Mill. Sheard's Mill, this is up near Quakertown. Um, I go with a plain air group every Wednesday. We go to different places around the area. It's called the Peace Valley Plain Air Group. And uh, there's a, a person that sends out, you know, the address for each week. So this is one that I've gone to several times. This is the Shards Mill. There's also a covered bridge and a creek. So there's a lot to see here. But then again, for some reason, these buildings always capture me, <laughs> capture my attention. So I always set up in front of a building. A lot of the people set up along the stream and they do water, but uh, buildings. But you do do landscapes. I think we have one coming up, Jen. Yeah, but I just like buildings. I just, yeah, you know, okay, this one. This was one that I was taking a walk and I took some pictures with my iPhone and went back and printed them out. And this is the painting that this took me uh, 
three different sittings to do it. It's larger too. It's like probably 20, I feel like 22 by 18 by 22 maybe, which is bigger for me. I, I usually work small because I'm outside in the place. But this was, I did back at home in my studio because it was during the winter and I was working from some, from some photographs. So I just sort of built it up. I did um, the trunks first and sort of added trunks where I needed trunks. And then I did uh, the shadows, the purple shadows. And then I did the sky and each, each sitting, I would just sort of, I would have to just do it for a couple hours and then take a break and then go do something else for the rest of the day. The next day I'd go back in and see, you know, what else does it need? And uh, so this was a buildup, which was different for me. I'd never done that before. I've always just done plain air. It takes me like two to three hours and I'm finished. But this was three different sittings during the day. And this one actually got um, juried into the Ellerslie um, open exhibit, which is a juried exhibit where you had to send in a digital image. And then if they liked the digital image, then you had to drop off the painting. And then they rejuried again and they selected like 130 some out of 600 and some from the beginning. And this one got accepted then through the second jury process. So this is hanging in Ellerslie right now um, in Trenton. If anybody wants to go check it out, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful exhibit of 130 some pieces of all different art, photography, painting, sculpture. And Ellerslie is back in um, Cadwallader Park. So it's in West Trenton. Anybody it's a beautiful to place there. to see artwork and a prestigious show too. So congratulations, Sue Ann. Thank you. That. Yeah. And I, I like here the, the, you said the shadows are purple, but I love how much red there is in that purple. It's a, it's an unusual shadow choice and uh, I congratulate you on it. It's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. I also find the area in the back right uh, intriguing because it seems, I don't know, it just seems like if it's for sky, it's very low horizon because um, we're looking really at the base of the trees. So the perspective seems uh, unusual to me, intriguing. For the sky, you mean? Or? Yeah, in the back right, is that that's the sky, right? The green, yeah. Yeah, the blue part's the sky. Yeah. And there was a big hill. So I had the shadows going up the hill to take your eye up. Right. Up the hill. Yeah, it's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. All right, uh, Jen, I think we've got some questions coming in. Okay. Yes, we do. Jim wants to know, Sue Ann, how do you protect your watercolors from moisture destruction? Um, I mat them and put them on um, an acid-free foam core and then an acid-free mat on top. And then I put them in sleeves or else I frame them. I, I do glass on top and frame them with a frame. And um, the foam core seems to keep the moisture out by using a foam core backer. It gives it a lot more um, protection than just a matte backer, especially for these um, the damp mills, like if it's gonna hang in Phillips mill, that's kind of damp. So you wanna make sure you have it protected from moisture. We're working on that, Sue Ann. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help it. It's a mill that used to have a creek running through it. I mean, that's right. Exactly. What are you going to do? <laughs> but we are working on it. We're, we're having meetings about that as we speak. And the dehumidifiers are running constantly. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> uh, and I think we've got another question, Jen, um, from Jean. Oh, yes. Jean wants to know, is it difficult to do a watercolor on site? Um, that's most of the only way I've ever done them. Um, I started doing plain air watercolor maybe four years ago. I was in a, this group called Artsbridge in Stockton, and they mentioned at their meeting that they have a plain air watercolor group. So I started going out with them, and that was how I learned to do watercolor. So for me, now it's not any more difficult than <laughs> painting watercolor, since that's the way I've learned. Are there, I, I know, like are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I like it because you're watching the light. It's some people I only work from photographs, but you already have a flat image that has already captured the light. It's just too two dimensional. I like to work out in nature with three dimensions. You can see the light moving and it's just, I just like it better because I can capture the light over those couple hours. I try to capture the light that works the best with the painting. Right. So I know you're part of a plein air group. Um, 
are there many other watercolors because we watercolors there because we think of it as sort of an oil medium and I, I think Jane Ramsey does watercolors plein air yeah she does group yeah um, I would say probably 70 percent are, are doing oils or acrylics yeah. and yeah yeah the rest of us are either just drawing some people just do pen and ink and some a few of us just do watercolor I like it because it's it's pretty easy it's compact it dries pretty fast. I can just toss it in my back seat and it's dry. So, you know, I don't have to worry about having all those um, the solvents and things that stay wet a long time. Right. And I flew, I flew all my supplies with me to Wyoming this year. I just like threw them in a big suitcase and I was able to take everything and just paint and then bring everything back. And it was all dry and easy, easy to travel with. I think we've got another question here. Thank you all for participating. Yes, thank you for these questions. This is great. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have one from Francisco Silva. Uh, and this is actually a really good one considering all the other medium that you work in. He asked, have you experimented with other liquid medium like gouache, oil, or acrylic? Or do you prefer the transparency of watercolor? I mean, in college, I had to I had to use all those, and I did pastel a lot too. But um, for some reason, um, I, I have done gouache too. I used to do gouache to do more design type things, just because it was more solid. For some reason, I just I've enjoyed these watercolors. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, yeah, people find their medium, I think. Um, right. Yeah. Well, although I say that and you're here because you have so many mediums, so. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Francisco. <laughs> yes, thank you, Francisco. Okay, we've. I want to see one more of your watercolors. We've got one more to look at. And I just think this is such a departure for you, Sue Ann. I wanted to make sure we looked at it because it, it's almost <laughs> an abstract. Exactly, yeah. I was painting up at Lake Nakamixon and uh, this was one I did later, but I did a small, a small um, plain air painting. And I, I thought it was interesting how it was just a bunch of, you know, line, a green line and then a shore line and the water line. And it's, it started to turn into abstract. So I took it home. And then later on in the winter, when I had time, I actually worked larger. This one's probably 20, 24, 16 by 24, I think it is. So I got to lay it all out and work larger. So I worked from another painting to this painting and I made it more abstract. The pink part has um, a metallic, a shiny shimmery metallic part in it. I just, I had fun with the sky doing, I'm having the clouds be more fun. I had fun with the water. I sprinkled some salt in the water to get some fun, um, you know, bursts coming out. I was, I guess, experimenting. And I, I really like how it came out. It was way more abstract than anything else I've ever done. Do you think you might work in this style again? I, I think it's very successful. I, there's a charming yeah. aspect to it. Thank you. Yeah, I probably will. I like, um, these are good for ones in the winter when I can't go out plain air painting. I'll probably work from another, either from a photograph or from a, another painting. And try to do, try some more of these. Thank you. So let we, I think we've got a couple of comments and then I'd like to get into the cookbooks and some of your other, I mean, the I can't, there's not just one more, two more media. So um, <laughs> we've yeah, got some dimensional things. things. Do it. Yeah, <laughs> three dimensional. So Jen, <laughs> let's get to some of those comments. Uh, sure, Suzanne said your work is very inspiring. I love the detail and perspective. Okay. And then uh, Jean said, this work of art, oh, um, I think she was referring to Lake Shimmers, uh, seems to flow in two different directions, which gives it such a sense of movement. Hmm. Yeah, that's neat. Uh, what, they go it, back and forth? Or? Yeah, Shall we look at that real quick, Jen, and understand that's, Jean's comment? What are the directions? Yeah. I think I can see what she means. Okay. Uh, so Jean said the work of art seems to flow in two different directions, which gives mm -hmm. it such a sense of movement. Okay. Oh, so I don't know what's in Jean's head, but I can sort of see you almost have the way this, the blue line goes across where the trees and the river meet, you will almost have 
uh, sort of one of those pictures where you stand way back and you see the earth curvature or something. I don't know. I'm yeah. making it up, but uh, Jean, thanks for that comment. Thank and you. Yeah. I guess it does go back and forth. Yeah. And I did do a curvature just to make it seem like it was a vast, a vast area that you were looking at. Uh, Laura, you're muted. <laughs> yep. uh, I was playing with my cursor as I was yeah. tracing technology. the <laughs> technology. <laughs> so um, while we look at the cookbooks, um, Sue Ann, you actually work professionally uh, as, a, as a chef. I did not know that about you. I was actually a baker for a while. Um, I started a baking business after I retired from doing graphic design and photography because my husband was afraid I would be bored at home or something. So it was like, you got to find something else to do. So I started a baking business. And then I was hired by several different restaurants to work for them. So I got into to cooking and baking for them. And then um, during COVID again, right in March, I decided this was the perfect time for me to start a cookbook because I was stuck at home. I couldn't go out. Um, so my husband had wanted me to gather all my different recipes together that I make all the time. Um, because I had them in all different notebooks on all different sheets of paper. And he's like, well, what if I want to make some of this stuff? So I said, okay, I'll, I'll put a book together for you. And then I told some other people about it. And they're like, oh, I like one of those books too. So I, saw, so I decided, okay, I had to do it, you know, a real book. So a lot of them are just recipes that I've had a long time that I've used from other cookbooks or from other people that have given me things. But they're all pretty much um, things that are pretty much plant-based. I stopped eating wheat because when I was a baker, I got really bad arthritis and it ended up that it was from wheat. So I had to stop eating wheat. So I had to change all my recipes from baking to use non-wheat products. And then I started using non-milk also. So I use almond milk and I never really liked meat. So I figured, well, I shouldn't be eating meat either. So I just, they're pretty much plant-based. And then the baking things are all using other flours. So as you'll see, there's almond milk, um, different kinds of flours. What's this one? Buckwheat flour in that one. And I use gluten-free all-purpose flours. So it's mostly plant-based foods with, um, you know, different flours. So and these so are a couple different uh, pages from the cookbook. And I do all the photography. And these are my blueberries that I pick in my yard. We have uh, 12 blueberry bushes. So I'm always looking for things to do with blueberries. So my pancakes always have blueberries in them. My pies always have blueberries in them. So we were talking about how you adapt recipes from other cookbooks. Could you talk about that process a little bit? Because I think a lot of people um, would like to understand that process. I know that I'm somebody who feels pretty tied to a recipe and I'm, I don't have a lot of confidence okay. going off point. Yeah, I like to change things. I don't like to use all the sugar that they use. So I try to use honey and maple syrup a lot of times. Plus, if you use maple syrup, then it's vegan, so vegan people can eat it. Uh, I try to do things that, that can be vegetarian and vegan. Um, because when I was working at Love and Oven was one of the restaurants I baked for, they always wanted to have some vegan items. So this was a way to do vegans by using maple syrup. Whereas if you use honey, that's still from an animal, so it's not vegan. So, <laughs> and then we try to use things without butter and without milk. So where we use almond milk, but I would just adjust things and make them and see how they came out. And then if they weren't quite right, I would adjust it a little more the next time and add some different ingredients. So. And Sue Ann, how do you think the creative process for cooking relates to the creative process for photography or painting? And for art, it's another art form. To me, it's an edible art form. You're creating things, you're using, you know, the ingredients are like my paints or my pastels or something. It's all just putting things together and coming out with a product at the end. So I would call myself like an edible artist because you know, I was making baked goods. Um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting how I, I like to put things together. I have to make things all the time, put things together and come out with something at the end. Yeah, I've heard you say that before, you have to make something every day. What happens if you don't? Uh, that's okay. It's just like, I, I was a teacher for 10 years, I was an adult evening school, and that was fun and fulfilling, but I still had to like make, make things. It just wasn't fulfilling enough. It's just part of my personality. I have to make things and 
come out with something at the end. So those are early days with the hand tools. Right. The of the abacus creation. Right. So the cookbook was fun. Anyway, so then I, um, so the first time I made them, I sold them on Instagram and Facebook. And I ended up, I, I think I ordered 80 of them and I sold out of them in a few months. So then this one that you just saw, this is the second version where I up, updated the cover. I updated some, some photographs and I put some more paintings in this time. As, um, I think Jen had one of the ones with the paintings in it just to make a little more, I had some more things to work. I had more time to work with. So this time I ordered 50 of them. So if there's anybody that would like one, you can let me know. You can uh, send me your address and I can mail you one out. And, uh, I like it with the paintings in it too. It's just yeah. it's very personal. I added paintings this time, yeah. So and this Jen, was, sorry, sorry. Field. This was the fall fields painting that I wanted to put in. And I figured it could have been a cornfield. So I put it in with the corn soup. <laughs> right, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at some of your other media. I, I was fascinated to see this as a weaver. Uh, and I've seen some things with uh, these. These are pack packing strappings. Is that right? Pack right. Strapping. Packing strapping that comes on hay bales. My husband orders hundreds of hay bales and they all come with these plastic straps on them. And he was taking them off and like cutting them up and throwing them away. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're filling landfills with all these plastic straps. I'm like, I have to figure out something I can do with these things. So at night I started weaving with them. Um, first I was trying to make balls, spheres, and then I tried to make some baskets um, with some open ends. And I was just trying different things to see what kind of shapes I could get from them. So this is, this is, I had all these different shapes. They were laying around in my living room for several months. I didn't know what to do with them. So I finally decided to hang them all. I hung them all in a mobile so that I hang them all at different lengths. And then when I hung them in front of lighting, the light would go through them as they were spinning around. All right, so these were interesting. I walked, worked on these for probably like six months making different shapes. So that was just something fun to do with material that would go to the landfill normally. Right. And we've got a comment from Nancy, Jen. Uh, yes, Nancy said that Jacques Pepin also has a cookbook with his paintings and poetry. Oh, nice. There you go. Yeah. And good company, Sue Ann. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Tell us about this nest. <laughs> the nest. Okay. These were, I had all these little leaf sticks on my back deck. Um, every, every fall, I get these leaf sticks all over the back deck. So I collected them all and put them in a bag. And the one day in my studio, I started stacking them up and they sort of looked like a nest. So I got my hot glue gun out from years ago, bought some new hot glue and started gluing them together, uh, going in a circle and just stacking them up and gluing them up. And I liked how the hot glue gun threads added to the whole making of the, of the nest. So I kept the hot glue gun going and I just kept making them until it was a, a tall enough nest to put something in. I had some light bulbs in my studio, so I threw those in there for them. But then, then I found an egg later on, so I, I threw a broken egg in there. And this was, um, this went into the New Hope um, sculpture. Um, it's a juried sculpture exhibit every year at New Hope Arts. So this was fun because I had never um, tried to get a sculpture in a show. So I, I entered this one and it got in, so that was, Pretty fun for me to get a whole different media accepted into a whole different kind of show that I had never tried to get into before. So I placed it on a piece of uh, marble that I had had left over from redoing a bathroom. So you have your hard, you know, smooth, cold marble, and then you had this little delicate nest that sat on top. I thought it was a nice contrast. And the pop of the blue is really yeah. Well. And then I had it on a black base, so they were able to they put it up on a black pedestal. For me. That was nice. So that was fun. I thought I'd do a series of nests, but I never got back to that. I have these ideas of doing series, but then my mind just takes me off onto some other project. <laughs> so the so series that, doesn't. I think done. that's such an important um, point, Sue Ann, for creative people. I, it's something I struggle with myself is lots of ideas, time, limited time to achieve them in prioritizing and project management. <laughs> right. 
how do you how do you uh, manage that process when you've got so many ideas in so many different media? How do you prioritize? How do you uh, drive through to a product? Um, I have to I have to take what seems the most um, interesting at the time. Like when I did this nest, it was really interesting. I thought I'm going to make a whole bunch more, but then I just sort of got. I had to go do painting again. So it, it's really hard to just focus and do one thing. Like some artists, they do one thing and they stick with it. And that's great for them. I wish I could do that, but I just can't do that. I have to just keep trying different things and seeing where I go with it and seeing if I like it. If I don't like it, then I just go back to doing the last thing I was doing. So I guess it's just what interests me at the time. And forward, I think you have a lot of energy too, Sue Ann. That's got to yes. be part of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the drive. Are you, sometimes I wonder, I think about your variety of endeavors and I think, um, you know, what makes you try so many different areas versus some artists you see, uh, they develop a style and they, uh, I'm trying to say it without sounding judgmental because I admire mm -hmm. it, but they, they work over and over in a similar field and become quite expert at, at it. And so it's just, it's sort of really two different styles. Do you ever struggle with that question? Yeah, I think I, at some times I should just stick with something and refine it and refine it, refine it. But that just as bores me after a while, I need to do something different. I need a new challenge. I'm not good with just repeating the same thing over and over. I mean, it's not the same thing, but I just, I get pulled with doing something else, with having a whole new challenge. For some reason, I like the challenge of something new. I respect people who can just do one thing really, really well. I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree and I understand. Yeah. Uh, I wanna deal with a couple, I get to a couple of comments. Uh, and I want you to know that people are asking for ways to get your cookbook. So Jen has put that information okay. in the chat. Thank you for that, Jen. Yeah. And can we get to, are there? Sure. Uh, There's, yeah. uh, Jean has had made a couple comments. She said the book is really interesting and the recipe is wonderful. I just obtained my copy yesterday and enjoy reading through and moving forward on making these inspiring and healthy recipes. Oh, and she yeah. described you as a creative spirit on every level. Thanks for being yeah. such an in thanks for being such an, an inspirational artist. So oh, great. Well, thank you. Kudos Jean. to you. And thank then you. Uh, Suzanne said had high praise again. This book presents the best of both worlds, art and wonderfully presented recipes. I have both books and treasure them. I am so amazed at all of your talents. I love how you're not afraid to try and experiment with so many mediums and artistic areas. Well, thank you, no. Suzanne. That's wonderful. I have to endorse that. The, um, the, the courage to try so many different things, I think is, yeah. is really admirable and you're successful, uh, which is impressive. So yeah. Sue Ann Rainey, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. It was wonderful. And thank you to our audience as well. We appreciate you joining us on a summer Sunday. I hope you'll join us all again uh, in two weeks when the internationally known sculptor George Antonison joins us. George is an extraordinarily talented artist as well as a pleasure to talk with. He's the 2021 Honored Artist at the Phillips of the Phillips Mill Art Committee. That's another one not to be missed. Uh, of course, we're here with Jen McHugh, the executive producer of Art Talk, and I'm your host, Laura Womack. Have a good evening. <laughs>